Welcome to the Brave Church Podcast. Our hope is that this message will encourage and inspire you in your walk with Jesus and help you move forward in the life that you're meant to live. Amen. Well, hey, we're going to continue on in worship here today. I'm very excited about what God has in store. We're in between sermon series. We usually do sermon series here at, at Brave Church. When I say usually, this church is about seven months old, so I guess we don't usually do anything. But uh, this week and next week, we'll have what we call standalone uh, messages. And uh, we're coming out of a series called If Jesus Were a Christian. Who was here for If Jesus Were a Christian? You, who here was challenged by that series? Sweet. We got another one coming up, sorry, on Mother's Day called Not Done Yet. But for today, I want to set up the scene here. We're going to look at uh, one of the most popular and famous passages in the Bible. I want to go back to 1 Samuel chapter 17, and it says this, For 40 days, every morning and every evening, the Philistine champion named Goliath. Y'all familiar with Goliath? Okay, cool. Strutted. Some of y'all are like, I didn't know that was in the Bible. Yeah, it is. It's awesome. Strutted in front of the Israelite army. One day, Jesse said to David, Jesse was David's dad, Take this basket of roasted grain and these 10 loaves of bread and carry them quickly to your brothers and uh, give them 10 cuts of cheese to their captain. Apparently this was a thing. You want to show some appreciation to the captain? 10 cuts of cheese. See how your brothers are getting along and bring back a report on how they are doing. And so David brothers were with Saul and the Israelite army was at the Valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. And when I say fighting, it's a loose term. They were really just standing around, as you'll find out here in just a second. So David left the sheep with another shepherd, hashtag delegation, and set out early. Everyone say early. Early. We're a church that it's okay to talk back with me. It's actually a lot more fun. It just is. If you're weirded out by that, I totally get that. I get it. You didn't grow up that way. That's cool. But we think, you know what? If we're going to spend, you know, three hours of our time this morning together, if we're going to spend some time with each other, let's have some fun. Amen? Amen. Feels good. As Jesse had directed him. And he arrived at the camp just as the Israelite army was leaving for the battlefield with shouts and with battle cries. It's not going to make sense, but I want to pair this verse with a verse in the New Testament that Paul said something here in Ephesians 5, and he said this, Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. Today, I want to talk under the title of The Moments I Need the Most. It's actually got a subtitle that I'd love for you to announce to five people around you. We're a brave, courageous church that loves community. And so I'd love for you to high five five people here in just a second and tell them, make it happen. Make it happen. High five five people, tell them, make it happen, and then you can be seated. Make it happen. Make it happen. Give it up for our worship team for making it happen. Give it up for um, all of our home teams here in a second, because I hope, like, if this is your first time, you don't know any different, but th this doesn't usually look like this. There's actually a school play here um, today, and so our team um, had to flex. Everyone say flex. If you're going to move forward, you got to be able to flex. And so our teams were flexing today, trying to figure out how we were going to set this out. We don't got drums today. Don't need them. Well, Steve, actually, we do. We need you. Come on back next week. Okay, great. Um, but so could you give it up for our home team of volunteers that made all this possible today? So I got a question for you. Have you ever noticed that when you look back at your life, you don't see... Um, a, a long record of every single minute and second and hour and day and year. Like you don't see a running list and log of, of everything that you've ever experienced. But have you noticed that when you look back on your life, you see a sequence of moments, one right after another? Like if I were to ask you about your childhood um, and ask you how, how was your childhood, you, you would not your mind would not go through every little thing that you experienced. 
and, and, and take a record of it and then give me a rating. It was about a 5.5. Um, but rather you would say it was good, bad, it was so-so, it was ugly based on just a handful of, of moments. Or if I ask you what, you know, about a restaurant that you've been to, you go there all the time and I would say, you know, how is it? You wouldn't think through every single bite, every single meal that you, you had there, but you would think of those few moments that hit you the most before you said, oh my gosh, you have to go there. So good. I was so intrigued by this concept a few years ago when I first started to realize this. I was so intrigued by it that I decided to do a little bit of an experiment with it. I decided to do a little experiment where I, I um, jotted down both mentally and in my journal, uh, in my diary, uh, I wrote down as much as I could um, about my, my honeymoon that I went on with Jackie. Jackie. And uh, let me explain this for a second. Um, because when Jackie and I were, uh, my wife, when we were engaged and people would ask us, are you going on a honeymoon? We'd be like, yes, we're going on a honeymoon. They all, married people, all said the exact same thing. Oh my gosh, the honeymoon. Best week of our lives. Best week. Every single person, every single married person, oh my gosh, the honeymoon. And it's not that I thought that they were liars. I just started to think like, you know, if everyone's having the best week of their life, everyone I just started to wonder if, if their memories were as in tune with how things really were. And so I, without Jackie's permission and without her really knowing at all, I took note of everything, everything. I, I took note of how we flew out very, very early on that Sunday. Um, we flew down to Cancun. I took, took note of, of the flights and the excitement. We're so excited about our honeymoon. And, and I took note about how when we got to our hotel in Cancun, you know, after a long emotional weekend and after, um, you know, a day, a long day of travels, I was so emotionally and physically exhausted that I had what most would call an emotional breakdown. Love the honeymoon. Oh, the honeymoon. Honeymoon. That's what just kept going through my mind as I was just crying myself to sleep. Oh, the honeymoon. It's the best week. And, I, and I, I, I recorded about how later that night um, things took a turn and, and we enjoyed watching the Packers beat up on the Lions 31-24 to clinch uh, the uh, NFC North Championship. Yep. And, uh, and I was eating chicken tenders while we were there. Uh, and uh, I record how the next day I wrote down that I, I came to the realization that Jackie and I have two very different philosophies when it comes to how much time a person should spend out in the sun by the water. Uh, because after about 30 minutes of, of laying out, I, I turned to her and said, okay, so what do you want to do next? And sh she just laughed like you just did. She just laughed. And so I recorded that I spent most of that day snorkeling by myself. I recorded um, how good the food was. Food was beautiful. Food was amazing. I recorded about, man, the weather at night was so beautiful. Oh, my gosh, we'd go on these walks and the weather, and they came back, and there was turn-down service, which just totally set the mood for watching a movie. And, um, and I recorded about how midway through the week, we got into one of the bigger arguments that we had ever experienced which led to some more snorkeling by myself. And I recorded how I taught her chess. Jackie, she's back there. I taught her how to play chess, and it was so cute. It was so cute teaching her how to play chess until we both got very competitive, and she learned how to play chess, and so we both got competitive, and we both got upset with each other. Cue more snorkeling by myself. And wouldn't you know it, two weeks, it wasn't but two weeks after we got back from our honeymoon, somebody asked me, how was your honeymoon? How do you think I responded? Oh, my gosh, the honeymoon, the best week of our lives. If you're looking for some light reading this week and some very interesting research about this concept, I would love to uh, recommend the book called Power of Habits, or I'm sorry, Power of Moments. That's another great book, Power of Habits as well. But The Power of, of Moments, it's written by Dan and Chip Heath, two brothers, and in their book, they explain this phenomenon by confirming that we do not measure our lives in minutes and seconds but rather we measure our lives using the moments that matter the most, or as they call them, defining moments. Defining moments that not only shape our memories, 
but they can change the course of our lives. Have you ever experienced a defining moment? You ever experienced a defining moment where, uh, you know, you were one person before that moment, before it happened, whether it happened in a second or it happened over a season? Looking at my friend, he was telling me about a moment that he had this last week. And you were one person before that moment, and after that moment, you were somebody completely different? Makes me think about one of my favorite characters in the Bible named Jacob. Go figure. Makes me think about his moment that he had in Genesis 32 where he came face to face with God incarnate, came face to face with Jesus. And you think that Jacob would have bowed down and worshiped Jesus immediately? Not Jacob. Not Jacob, but Jacob rather did what he had been doing his entire life. He started wrestling with God incarnate. And Genesis 32 records that he kept on wrestling and wrestling with Jesus until finally God blessed Jacob by way of dislocating his hip and by way of giving Jacob a brand new name, Israel. Because how many of y'all know that some of the most defining moments with God are not when you get what you want? They are not when you get your way, but it's when God gives you a new way of seeing yourself. And it's not when God changes your situation. I found many times I catch myself praying for God. Oh my God, would you please change my situation? But I found God more times than not, he doesn't change my my situation, but he will change the way that I see myself. And he will show me that his strength is within me and his strength that is within me is strong enough to get me through the situation, not get out of it. Are you guys ready to preach today? Okay. I love that. I love that it says that Jacob was blessed by way of a dislocated hip. How many of y'all know that some of the most defining moments will leave you with a limp? Even the best ones, even the best ones, the best defining moments that you get with God, you will walk out of it a different way than you walked into it. Or how have you ever um, experienced a defining moment that changed your vision for your life? Maybe it altered your expectations for what you thought was possible in your life. Makes me think about another famous story that you've probably heard about Peter. Peter walking on water. Peter walking on water with Jesus until Peter got distracted by the wind of the waves and he started to drown. And he had to get saved by Jesus. I don't know if you've ever heard that, that message preached before about Peter, but I have. And it seems like I always hear, like, you know, Peter just gets such a bad rap about that. Don't be like Peter. I got one point today. Don't be like Peter. He doubted Jesus. When you're in the storm, keep your eyes on Jesus and you won't, you won't doubt and you won't sink. And don't you be like Peter. And I get that. Peter, you know, I get that. And I, it really makes a lot of sense because isn't it a lot easier to criticize people from inside the boat while they're out on the water? And, and I get that, that he lost his focus, but Peter was also the only one that got his brave butt out of the boat. And he might have had some trouble once he got out there. And he might, have, he might have flinched a little bit and he started to drown. But Peter was also the only one that got a one-on-one experience with the God's power. And he was the only one that got a one-on-one education in the grace and mercy of God. You see, Peter, the thing about Peter is he walked out there, he slipped up and he fell. But he learned two very big things. He learned not only that anything is possible with God, that's good. That, that you need that. We need that in our lives. We need to know and trust that anything, anything is possible with God. He got that. That'll make you a dreamer. That'll make you ambitious. But Peter also realized that God's grace will be there for us when we fail. When we fail. Everyone say when. When, not if. When. Not maybe. Most definitely. I don't even know you, but I can tell you two things about you. Number one, you're going to mess up. Number two, God's mercy will be there for you when you do. And when you get that combo, when you get that combo in your life and you realize both that God is able to do exceedingly more than I can ask or imagine, and you also get God's grace, that God's grace will be there for you when you make a mistake, that will make you courageous, my friends. That will make you take some steps into some uncertainty, knowing that God's presence is always a certainty. That will make you audacious. That will keep you brave. That's okay. You can applaud the scripture. I need that. I need to get pumped up about that. Speaking of brave, I don't know if you noticed this last weekend, but we experienced somewhat of a defining moment for for our church. Defining moment where 
we got to see just a glimpse of what is possible when just a few people decide to be a part of something bigger than themselves. I think we've got some pictures in how this church did an Easter egg hunt on Saturday. And, and just a few people were able to impact over 770 people with the love and generosity of Jesus. That's pretty sweet. That's a moment. And then on Sunday, the following day, we saw, we saw just about 120 people in this church. And at the end of the message, we saw six people commit their lives to following after Jesus. I don't know about you, but I think that's worth applauding for. That God's up to something. That God's doing something through us. I think that's great. But might I take a moment just to say that we are just getting started here? Because that was a moment. That was a moment. I'll tell you what I saw. I saw 770 people from all different ages, races, and income levels coming together around fun community enjoyment. That's cool. That's awesome. But it made me start to think, what would happen in Milwaukee if there was a church like that with all sorts of races, ages, and income levels? It made me start to wonder, what would happen if there was a movement like that, where it was a movement of people who were not satisfied to isolate themselves by their, their racial differences and their socioeconomic differences, but rather, what if there was a movement of people that prioritized Jesus and were dead set on seeing life change in the lives of others? Can I let you in on something? I got a secret. I got a secret. Lean in for this. We are becoming that church. That's what's happening. Let me say it another way. We have to become that church. We have to. Because Milwaukee needs a church like that. About to preach, pardon my. But we need a church like that. We don't need another white church, y'all. We do not need another black church. We do not need a church that is simply defined by the skin color of the people that go there. But we need a church that is defined by Jesus. We need a church that people know about what they're doing in the community and the difference that they're making. We need to be that church, and we will be that church. So you can go ahead and uh, timestamp this, Nate. You can timestamp this. April 28th, Pastor Jacob was up there talking crazy talk. When there were maybe, uh, I'm a horrible count, I don't know, 60 people in here. And he was talking about how we're going to be this big movement, timestamping, and watch what God does. Defining moments will change the way that you see. Defining moments will change what you expect. Defining moments will change how you walk, defining moments will change how you live, and yet, cue the tension, found that a lot of us experience far too few moments. And maybe that's where you're at today. Because we're getting pumped up about moments and, and you're, you're thinking, I need my moment. We experience far too few of them, and it's not because we don't want them. If I did a poll, I am quite positive that everyone raised their hand. I would like a moment. Yes, defining moment. Change the way that I walk. I'll take the limp, Jesus. I'll take the limp. I'll turn it into a little bit of swagger if I got to. I will take the limp. <laughs> it's not because we don't need a moment, because Lord knows we, we really do. But as Dan and Chip Heath would agree, I think that a lot of us miss out on the moment that we need the most because we fail to understand how moments work. We, 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 we fail to define them correctly because it's easy to hear about Jacob and his little wrestling match and, and sit there wishing, I would like my wrestling match, Jesus. Where's my moment? I'll wrestle. I'm ready to wrestle. It's easy to, to hear about Peter and, and wish that God would in some way, shape, or form allow you to walk on water on some things in your life. Where's my moment? That's great for Peter, but where's, where, 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 where's, where's my moment, Jesus? It's easy to look at the lives of other people and see long lists of defining moments, one right after another, and sit there wishing and waiting for your moment to arrive because it is very easy to think that moments, defining moments, just happen. Came with an announcement today. They don't. They, they don't just happen. Defining moments don't, don't just happen. Some do. Some do. Some do. Some, some defining moments will just happen whether you are looking for them or not. I was not looking for a defining moment in my life when I stepped into that chiropractic office for an initial consultation. 
But when that blonde haired girl looked up at me from that desk and she asked for my name, date of birth, and I'm sorry, what was the third thing, ma'am? Some, some do. Some moments will, will just happen. But while we're waiting for those moments to happen, there are some defining moments that are waiting on us. Here's how Paul said it in Ephesians 5. He said, therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. Do you mind if I go Greek on you for a second and share with you some Greek that I learned this last week? You do not need to know Greek in order to experience God. In fact, I just learned these words this last week, so I'm not too far ahead of you. Can I go Greek for a second? And I'll probably botch how I say them anyway, so you'll feel, you'll feel included. I found out that the phrase making the most of, making the most of comes from the Greek word that Paul used, which was exagerazo. Say it to your neighbor. Go on, turn. I just said it. Look at exagerazo. Yeah, that's what I thought. Don't judge me. And I found out that this Greek word means to redeem, to take back, to take hold of. I also found out that the word that Paul uses for time is not um, chronos, which was um, meaning time as in chronological till we get chronological minutes, seconds, hours, days. It just happens linear, one right after another. But he uses kateros, which means the points that are within time that end up defining the times. I think there's a word that we know for that. Um, he, he was talking about moments. You see, 2,000 years before Dan and Ship Heath wrote a book called The Power of Moments, the Apostle Paul wrote about the power of moments to the Ephesian church. And somehow, even though the Apostle Paul didn't have all the little case studies and the, and the research that Dan and Chip had, somehow he came to the same conclusion. Somehow, Paul, he didn't have all the, all the computers and he wasn't able to do all these big polls or anything. Somehow, the Holy Spirit, somehow Paul was able to deduce the exact same thing, that we do not have to wait for moments to happen, but rather... We can and we are meant to take back the time and make moments happen. Someone say, make it happen. Make it happen. Now, I got to warn you, little warning here, because when you realize this about your life, especially when you realize this about yourself as a Christ follower, it will cost you something. It will cost you, let's call it the magic of the moments. The magic of the moments. Have you ever noticed that we as Christians often also believe in magic too? Where things just, just happen. Just happen. But we don't say that and we obviously don't call it magic. But we say things like, it was a God thing. It was just a God thing. You know how God is? It was just a God thing. It was a God thing. One time I was having a conversation with a friend of mine, um, Key context here is an atheist friend of mine and so of course I was getting all riled up trying to tell him about Jesus and we were we were conversing and I was telling him this was sometime last year and I was kind of making my case for God because God needs that right <laughs> and I'm going on and on about you know let me tell you something friend I was like um you know we were in a spot a few months ago where we didn't have a place to have this church that we're trying to launch and we were looking I was freaking out until finally I met this guy named Ken at the at the YMCA we we're playing ball and and he was the first one to mention Milwaukee Lutheran High School and I was like oh my gosh that would be a great place to start a church and, and then he tried to like get it moving but didn't really move much and you wouldn't oh, man yeah I started losing my hope I said you know I was actually starting to look into other options until all of a sudden it was a Wednesday night you'll never expect this defining moment in my life life. I was like, I was, I was at this real small, um, um, a little, a basketball ministry and I was preaching there and I didn't even want to be there. I was all upset about this. I don't want to go preach to a little basketball ministry. I got done preaching. I was like, oh, that's great. I'm glad that they listened not. And I, and I was like so overwhelmed, but then all of a sudden this big white dude with a, with a goatee and, and, a, and a red Knights Lutheran jacket came up to me and he was like, Hey, where are y'all meeting? I said, we don't have a church yet. We, I mean, we're looking for a church right now. And he said, I tell you what, I teach in Milwaukee Lutheran high school. And I'm going to do whatever I can to get you into that facility. And once you see, yeah, go ahead and applaud that right now, right now we're here. That's what I told my friend. 
And I told my friend, I said, we're here thou, man. Explain that, man. That's a God thing. That is a God thing. My friend looked at me and he said, it sounds like good networking. You got me. And I'm so thankful he said that. He doesn't know this. I've never told him, and I don't think he'd like to hear it because he would disagree. That I'm glad that he said that because when he said that, it kind of shifted the way that I, I, I saw how God works. And it made me realize that, yes, I fully believe this right here was God's plan. But it did make me see that I was a little bit of a part of it. it I, 100%, this was all God's plan. Jackie would tell you what my plan was, my backup plan. My backup plan was three times more expensive, and, and we wouldn't have been able to use it on Mother's Day. Lame. That was, it was God's plan, but I, I started to see that God's plan was connected to my participation. And, and it was all God on the directing, but the instrument was in my hands. It was all God on the orchestration, but his orchestration was directly connected to my obedience. It made me start to realize that a lot of times when we miss the moment that we need the most, when we miss these defining moments, I think that it's oftentimes that we fail to see that the makings of the moment are in our own hands. Man, we could go so many directions with this right now. If you all know about the feeding of the 5,000, we could go in that direction. And how the makings for the miracle, and there's just little boy's hands, and out of like 10,000 people that were really there, he was the only one with food. No, he was the only one that was able to offer up just a little bit. We could go in that direction. We could talk, go back to the Old Testament. We could talk about the woman that she didn't have enough oil, and her, or, and, her, and her kids were about to get sold off, and so Elisha showed up, and he used the little, little bit of oil. That he, but we don't do that. I want to go to David, because I love David's defining moment. And the odds are you know all about this story. Spoiler alert, the giant goes down. I want to go back to David, David, the giant slayer, David, one of the most defining moments in, in the Bible, David, who strolled up on that battlefield just in time, perfect timing, perfect timing. He showed up there. Did you see that? It said just as, just as the armies were about to leave, just as he was about, they were about to go out there and he could have missed it, but he got there just, I love God's timing, don't you? Yeah, I do. But I also like the fact that Samuel gave us a little bit more context and it said that um, David got up early that day. David, David was a morning person, or rather he made himself one. And he got up early that day and he left for the battlefield just as soon as he could. And because he was early and because he got there earlier than he probably needed to be there, he got there just as the army was leaving. I've got three little points for us today that I'm going to go through very quickly because there's a Bucks game on at noon and I want to watch them win too. I got three points and the first one is this. We would be amazed at what God can do through our lives if we would just create a little bit of capacity for him to step into. Somebody say make room. Make some room. You need a moment? Make some room in your life. That's why we have a saying here that I'm trying to get to take off. Brave time. Be there at brave time. If we're supposed to be there at 10, get there at 945, 950. Is something going to happen? I don't know, but something could happen in that extra 15 minutes. I'm so lonely. Get here 15 minutes early. That'll change. Ain't nobody want to talk to you during worship. Get here early. Brave time. Brave time. Make some, make some room. Do you need a moment in your marriage? Make some room. In your calendar for that date night you've been talking about for the last six months. Well, it's just so difficult with kids. It's difficult with kids. Wait till you have them. I know. I get that. I get that. Well, and, and then, you know, you've got to get a sitter. you got to find a sitter. Yeah. I will babysit your kids if that will give you a moment. <laughs> Disclaimer. Will they survive? I don't know. All right. No guarantees. All right. I ain't asking to get paid. Do you need a moment in your finances? Make some room. Make some room. Make some room. A lot of times when we have a lack of financial peace, it is not because God is not extending it to us. It is because there is no place to put it. Financial peace comes from financial margin. Yep. Week after Easter, we're talking about finances. I ain't scared. Furthermore, 
a lot of times our lack of generosity is not a heart issue. I've never met someone that said, I hate generosity. Well, I don't believe in generosity. I've got a really firm doctrine on that. <laughs> and I've got some issues. I've actually got 10 points why you shouldn't be generous. Let me show them. To you. Never met that person, maybe. Never met that person. But I have found that if we spend our way into scarcity, we will have nothing left to be generous with. And it don't matter what your little heart wants to do. You ain't got no margin. You ain't got no space. You ain't got no capacity. Capacity. I don't know if you noticed this when you walked in. Um, I should probably show it. I don't know if you noticed this. I, I see it every single Sunday. It's right. We got some over here. Got some over here. And then uh, if you look to your right, my left, we got some over here. You know what that's called? That's called space. That's called capacity. That, that, that's called room. And if you're wondering why I believe so much that God can do an amazing thing through this church, it's because we're making room for him. It's because we've got some capacity. We've got some space. And as long as we are provided with some space and some opportunity to reach people who need Jesus, and as long as there are people that need Jesus, we will always be the church that presses on to try to reach them. Say amen if you're with me. Amen. Make some room. Make some room. Do you have some capacity for your moment to happen? Number two, I told you, you're on the fast track. You signed up for the Disney fast track pass. Number two, do you have commitment? Did you catch this? Did you catch this? Um, that David's dad did not tell David to go and um, defeat a giant. He, D David's dad did not, I'm looking at it right now. David's dad did not tell him to go to the battlefield and save the day. That was not his marching orders. Uh, David was not told by his dad to go and go, you know what, son? Go get your breakthrough moment. You go get yours. You go get yours. That didn't happen. But rather, um, David's dad told him to, to take just some cheese and crackers, some food to his brothers. Oh, and then bring back a report on how things are going. Don't miss this. David's defining moment ended with him holding the head of a giant, but it began with him running cheese and crackers to his brothers. Can you imagine the swag that David had after this moment? Father said to bring back a report. Things are going okay. <laughs> They're all right. Thanks, Dad. Lean in for this. Commitment is the access pass to meaning. Commitment is your permission slip to experiencing purpose in your life. Devotion is your ticket to the defining moment that you are praying for. I love millennials. I love millennials. I'm one of them, which is why I get to talk about them. I love millennials. And the thing that I love about uh, millennials and, and the thing that I love, what's the newest one? Gen, Gen Zers? Is it Gen Zs? Gen Zs? Okay. Yeah. Um, I, what, the thing that I love about us is that we want purpose and meaning in our life. I love that, that, that millennials, we, we do not want to live our lives. We don't want to do anything that doesn't have a, a greater purpose. I love that. But something that I think that we millennials and Gen Zers need to learn from the previous generations, get ready to clap my baby booners and, and, and my, my Gen, uh, Gen Xers, right? Gen Xers, yeah. Um, get ready to clap. One thing that we need to learn from the previous generations is that meaningful often shows up in the middle of mundane. Meaningful often shows up in the thing that you think is insignificant. God bless David. That dude would have missed his moment if he were born a millennial. Want to know why? This would have been David. You would have gotten those cheese and crackers. They would have been like feeling cute. <laughs> Might run some bread and cheese to my brothers. IDK. But rather David was able to take hold of the thing that everyone else overlooked. I love what Paul says in uh, 1 Corinthians 1.28. He says that our God, this is how our God works. Our God loves to use the things that we overlook to impact the entire world. I, our God, our God, this is how our God works. He loves to, to use seasons, seasons of insignificance. You're in a season of insignificance. God loves to use those seasons to shape our lives. God loves to use the people who are less likely to succeed in the eyes of the world to shake the status quo. God loves to make moments out of things that we think are meaningless. But are you willing to commit to it? Can you commit? Do you have the capacity for something to happen in your life? Do you have the commitment that's bigger than your circumstances? 
Do you have the commitment that is bigger than your circumstances where there is something within you that determines how hard you work and what you take seriously or is it always the number on your paycheck? Is it always the affirmation of others? Well, they just don't see me there. That's fine. Jesus sees you. And last time I checked, they don't get to hold your destiny. Do you have the commitment that's bigger than your circumstances? And lastly, do you have the courage that every great defining moment requires? David showed up to the battlefield for the first time and he heard Goliath's taunts and his jeers for the first time come to find out that the Israelite army that was there, thousands and thousands of men, had heard those jeers and those taunts 40 other times. And yet while they stood there well equipped, well trained, at the right place, at the right time, they also stood there in their disbelief, their discouragement, and in their fear, waiting for a defining moment to happen. Waiting for a defining moment. I didn't give you this verse, but if you were to read this little scripture, 1 Samuel, this week, you fast forward to verse 23, it says that, that he had been doing it so long, for 40 days, got up. For 40 days, that when David got there, verse 23 says that David got there just in time to hear Goliath's taunts. But they weren't just Goliath's taunts. But at this point in time, Samuel is very specific to describe them as his typical taunts. His usual jeers. His normal behavior. Because that's the thing about fear. Fear will make situations in your life go from bad to worse to just normal. Fear, fear will tell you that as long as you move, you won't fail. Fear will, fear will show up in your life and start spinning some Tupac and talent. That's just the way it is. Things will never be the same. Yeah, I guess so. That's just the way it is. Yeah, I guess it is. Things will never be the same. And so then it becomes easier, fear will tell you. It will become easier to just say that it's okay. Fear will tell you, you know what, just if you just accept it, you won't have to address it. Fear will, fear will say if you just try to ignore it, it won't impact your life. Here's what fear will do. Fear will make you patient when it comes to the moment that you need the most. But courage, when you let some courage run through your veins, when you let some courage start taking a beat, like David, courage, courage will make you start tuning into things that other people are trying to tune out. Milwaukee needs some more courageous people because we've just tuned some things out for the last 40, 30, 50, whatever. Tuning out. Courage will make you tune some things in. Courage will make you run towards some things that everyone else is running from. Courage like David, like David did. Courage will make you step onto the battlefield and when everyone else just sees an unavoidable obstacle that it would just be easier to, to overlook and ignore. Courage will make you see the opportunity to make the moment happen. Somebody say, make it happen. Make it happen. There's some moments that your family needs and it's up to you to make them happen. There are some moments, there are some moments in your marriage and you've been waiting for it because it was natural when you were 18. <laughs> it, was, it just came natural when you were in your 20s. But now it's just the romance isn't there. Yeah, make it happen. Make it happen. There are some moments in our community that our community is waiting for this church to make them happen. That's what last Saturday was. It was a moment that this church made happen. I, well, I just, it would be great if we could just get the community together and just, we just, you know, let's just, let's have a prayer circle. Can we all just sit around and pray? We need to start, stop praying about some things and start putting our, our practice in and start putting some preparation in and making the moments. There's some moments in my life that are up to me to make. Paul said it this way. He said, you need to make the most of the moments. You need to make the most of the time because the days are evil. The times, this, this culture, this era, it's evil. Have you ever noticed that time, time, these times, these times, 
will just take your time if you don't make it happen. And if you just go with the flow, the flow is going to go, it's going to take you. And if you just wait, time will steal your opportunity. But Paul says, because you've got the spirit of God within you, you are empowered to take back the time and make moments happen. Let me ask you a question. What's the moment that you need the most? And furthermore, what is keeping you from making it happen? What is the moment that you need the most right now? You're praying about it, that's cool. You're seeking God about it, that's awesome. But could it be that the makings of that moment, at least one little bit of it, got to line up some things and just get there on time. Just make a little space for them. God will use some pretty insignificant times. God will use that, that little part-time job that I got at that little fitness desk making 10. I got to raise 10, 10. I think I make $10 and 10 cents. God will use that job because no job, no Milwaukee Lutheran High School. God, God can work with some commitment. Do you have some courage? Or have you been waiting to feel courageous? Have you been waiting to feel up to it? Courage is not a feeling. Courage is an override on the emotions. It's in you. It's in you. What's the moment that you need the most? In two weeks on Mother's Day, because we moved it, we are going to have a celebration of a couple moments that we think are important in the local church. On Mother's Day, we will be experiencing one, we'll be doing child dedications because we think our kids matter. And we don't just think and pray that they'll grow up and be a generation that makes a difference for Jesus, but we think that they're so important that we want to create a moment where the church comes around our children and you think that it's dedicating them up to you. Oh no, oh, oh no. I'm just giving you over my kids, God, do what you want. No. That was a pretty story with Hannah and 2 Samuel. That was a good story. I love that story. Am I preaching in the next series? I don't know. That's really cute. But child dedications is all about us creating a moment where we dedicate ourselves to seeing the next generation come up and make a difference in Milwaukee. Yeah. And the second, the second moment, so important that Jesus mandated it. That's what it is, a moment. It's a moment so important that Jesus himself said, you should do this. He said, you should be baptized. You should have a moment. Water baptism, signifying the change that's in your heart, signifying that the transition from going from one direction to the next. Read that book. It's so good. Dan and Chip, such smart guys. They talk about one of the prime times to making a moment is in a transition. Any sort of transition in your life, it's primed. It's ready for you to make a moment out of it. Jesus, is that, that's silly that Jesus knew about this. That the biggest transition in our lives, the biggest decision in our lives, following Jesus, turning from how we lived, from who, what, what else that we were following, turning and following Jesus, Jesus thought, hey, this is a prime time for a moment. Why don't you go down into water, signifying that you're going down, you're taking your old life down into the water, and when you come back up, because here's what Dan and Chip Heath said. This is what they said, not Jesus. They said that when you make a moment out of that, it makes it far more likely that you are actually going to move forward in the direction that you wanted to go because you created a moment. Because you've got a moment, now you look back and you said, I'm not that person anymore. I don't, I don't walk that way. I don't talk that way. I'm not living for meaningless things, but rather I'm following Jesus and I've got a moment that reminds me of that. So my challenge to you, church, is... Have you made that moment yet? Have you experienced it yet? It's not a tradition. It's not something that we do just because. It's just because what Jesus said. It's because there's power in a moment. And I want to challenge you so, so very just clearly and seriously that you need to get online if that's you. And you've been following Jesus. Or maybe you just gave your life to Jesus in the last few weeks, but you've yet to experience that moment. Is it scary? Yep. 
Yeah, it is. Is it kind of awkward? A- absolutely. Yup. Is it, is it uncomfortable? Yup. How many of y'all have ever done something worthwhile that was not scary, awkward, or uncomfortable? Yeah. So, so, so yeah, it's worthwhile if that's what you're looking for. It's worth it. What's the moment that you need the most? And what is keeping you from making it happen? Let's pray. God, thank you for this moment. That's what church is. That's why we put so much energy into this. Why teams get here at 5.45 a.m. to set up the stage. That's why why our, our brave kids leaders, why they sacrifice their moment to give a moment to our kids because we believe that there's something powerful in a moment. And we believe that every single week, man, we should have a moment where we get filled and refueled to follow you and follow you together. So thank you for this moment. God, this is is a message, Father, that I hope in every person's heart it touched on something. You're the only one that can do that, God. And so, God, I pray that you would give us clarity about the moments that we need to make happen for the marriages that have just been going with the flow 20 years in, not thinking that you're going to make it 20 more years because you lost everything that you built your marriage on and you're saying there's a moment to make. There's a moment to make. There's a moment to make. It's going to take some capacity and you got to set aside the business of your life. It's going to take some commitment because you ain't going to feel like doing it. You just got to commit to it. And it's going to take some courage, not knowing whether it's going to work out or not, but it's a moment that's waiting to be made. There's moments every single day in our lives that are being that are available to us. Moments with cashiers. And we see their look in their eyes and we see that they're having a bad day and they're just waiting. Would you make a moment for me? Moments in our coworkers' lives. Because we are, our ears, we hear what's going on in their lives and, and, and we pray for them, that's cool, but it's just like, it's right there. Another moment, God, we're reminded that Dan Chip talked about was the pits, the low moments. And those moments, here's what we do with the pits, we fill them. And so when we see people that are experiencing lowness, when we see people experiencing discouragement, that is the prime time to step in and fill it with life, fill it with truth, fill it with hope. Moments all around just waiting for us to make them, God. And we pray that you would empower us to do that. We believe this in your name, Jesus Christ. If you believe that and you want to make some moments this week, would you say amen? Amen. 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 Give God praise this moment. He is the moment maker. If you enjoy listening to the Brave Church podcast and think others could too, please rate us on whatever platform you're listening on and be sure to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. If you'd like to support Brave Church financially, you can do that by going to bravechurch.tv give. Again, that's bravechurch.tv give. Thanks for listening.